Good morning. My name is Dr. Mehnaz A. Shafi. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Texas in the Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you very much for this invitation to speak today. My topic is ergonomics in endoscopy, prevention of injury. Uh, I have a long endoscopy. definition here, which is the scientific discipline concerned with ergonomics understanding comes from the Greek interactions of which and other means natural laws in so urban system. The profession Reef that applies the economics is to design, optimize human beings and overall system performance. So this is a big mouthful. The short version is it's the study of work. So the goal of ergonomics is to optimize the interaction of the operator with his or her tools, tasks and workforce to minimize injury and maximize efficiency. This is a general statement about work and a worker. There are certain risk factors that are put you at risk for work-related strain or injury, such as repetitively doing something, prolonged awkward postures, high use of high forces, contact stress, vibration. If you look at endoscopy, there are many risk factors that you can apply here. Repeated pinching or gripping of the endoscope, pushing, pulling, and torquing of the insertion tube, and working in awkward postures. This is one of the first overuse syndrome study that was done in endoscopists. It's a uh, very nicely done survey which was published in 1994. They surveyed 400 gastroenterologists to see if they had overuse as a result of endo endoscopic procedures. They had a phenomenal response rate, 72%. If you send out service to people, the response rate is usually 15% if you're lucky. But they had a good response rate. And this is what they said. Thumb pain, hand pain, elbow pain, low back pain, and shoulder pain possibly appear to be caused by endoscopy to at least some extent. Physicians who perform the most procedures tended to have the higher risk of developing such problems. So almost 40, more than 40% of patients who responded, physicians who responded said they had experienced injury for, which had been chronic for more than six months. This was a survey where they did, uh, looked at internists and they looked at those who did procedures and, and compared them to those who did not. So they looked at gastroenterologists and non-procedure internal medicine specialties. And again, they had a really good response rate. And the groups were quite compatible. And they found that the risk of musculoskeletal injury in the GI group was higher, 74% versus 35 So almost double, and the p-value was significant. The common sites were thumb, lower back, hand, and neck. This study did not find any association between how much you did or how long you were doing. So this is, I think, what I would call like a landmark paper, and it's really the only good, good technological review that we have to date, which is was put forward by the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy almost eight years ago, seven years ago. And they said, uh, what will minimize hazards of in endoscopy? And an, a small aspect of that was ergonomics. So they said this, Prevalence of musculoskeletal injury is quite a huge range, you know, anywhere from 37 to 89%. So these complaints are more in GI people, and they're more in people who perform more than 20 endoscopies per week, which I think is a very small number compared to what we do now. 20 in a week, and uh, according to this, was put you at risk. So they looked at an ergonomic risk assessment tool called OPRA. And this looked at people who perform endoscopies and they estimated that 10% of endoscopies will develop injury after 10 years. And overuse is due to microtrauma. Microtrauma at the tendon, ligament, level, maybe from acidosis, ischemia. Specifically to us, there is something called a colonoscopist thumb which is a tendonitis of the left thumb due to repetitive strain. So while you're holding the dial, if you're repeatedly putting excess pressure on the left thumb, 
by controlling their dials, this can cause pain. Similarly, there's something called a biliary endoscopist knuckle, which is a carpophalangeal joint from making a forceful pinch and advancing catheter. So there, which is a separate injury. So also injury from forceful pushing of wires and catheters through the biopsy channel, pinch force injury. And this is not just US, I put this in to show that, uh, you know, this is a study from Japan where they looked at endoscopists and other gastroenterologists who did not do endoscopy. And they compared injury and they found that again, frequency of pain in the hand and wrist, especially the left hand was significantly higher in people who did endoscopy compared to the non-endoscopists. I personally like this data and I would recommend if you would want to review this. Riddick did this study where it's a survey based study but he asked people questions about injury and asked them in relation to the time when they did procedure. So how do you feel now versus on the weekend when you're not doing procedures? What is, so that was, and they found again that um, there was a higher rate of injury definitely related to endoscopy uh, both in community practices perhaps more so than in academic centers. The, the measure here also is used they felt that more than 20 endoscopies per week put you at risk so that just tells what we do those who do much more than that. So they looked at what what was um, the experience and they looked at about um, uh, 680 people, 684 and half of them said that they had had some injury related to endoscopy. Now this is self-reported so maybe there's a bias but it does tell you that it gives you pause for thought that this is not insignificant and uh, about 20% said they had required time off from endoscopy. They had right to, half of them said they had to modify their practice in some way, either by doing less procedures, perhaps sitting down and doing procedures, and to a large extent they had required some kind of treatment. So the type of injury, we again see a pattern, it's thumb pain, shoulder pain, hand, neck, upper back pain, lower back pain, elbow, and top of tunnel syndrome. What were the modifications people did? So, you know, some people incorporated stretches, breaks, they adjusted their table, they did less endoscopy, they stood on rubber mats or got better shoes, they got physical therapy, rest, etc. So their conclusion was that a higher volume was significantly associated with a higher rate of injury. Um, again, how many procedures you did a day also mattered and they were not able to sort out if half a day off made it better, if you did half a day of a lot of procedures was that the same as all day long of the same number of procedures. However, they clearly make the association between volume and injury and the greater proportion of time spent during endoscopy was associated with a higher rate of injury. The other question that comes to mind is, is a longer procedure a risk factor? You know, maybe you're doing one, but you're doing a complicated EUS, FNA, ERCP, and it's a two hour, you know, does that put you at risk? Some questions we don't know. So, the one thing this showed was that colonoscopy by itself appeared to be a risk factor. So, of the procedures you do, colonoscopy is one that appears to have a higher rate of association between injury and in this particular study they did not find that doing ERCP or EUS put you at higher risk of injury. However, there weren't that many people uh, who did, who did uh, and I think we've covered this. So in MD Anderson, we do, uh, this is a very high volume center, high volume. A lot of our patients are very complex, they have uh, uh, cancer, they have uh, malignant strictures, they are on thrombolytics, they have neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, so long complex procedures happen. We have 14 full-time gastroenterologists and 11 of them spend 22 hours or more per week in the endoscopy unit. We do about 1200 
procedures a month. So I informally looked at the previous two years and found that three of the 11 endoscopists had been injured and they had significant injuries requiring time off for up to three months or longer, requiring surgery, requiring a room change, equipment change, so not trivial strain but significant injury. In on analysis and review, I didn't go into details, most likely it's from chronic overuse. Um, so I wrote this article which was published in AGA Perspectives where I said we must ensure that the endoscopy unit is not a hazardous place for the endoscopist because our focus always is that it should be a safe place for the patient and that is very appropriate. But we sometimes do not focus on what is safe for the physician. And uh, after years of practice, one of our surveys, I'll come to that, showed that after 11 years of endoscopy, you're at risk of significant musculoskeletal injury. So that, all that training and then you're. So uh, the AG, the American Gastroenterology Association, conducted a survey on ergonomics and endoscopy. So I was part of developing this survey and it's a 20, it's a 290 item survey with drop down menus to try and capture what is going on and then of course it's a survey itself reported but it gives us some information. So we sent a survey to 10,500 people. We had a very modest response. <laughs> About 826 people responded. We, uh, we, you know, and these are people who at least did at least 80% of the questions. We did not include people if they had done less than that or had done partial. And we excluded people who had not done endoscopy in the past five years. So 36% uh, of the respondents were women. The median age was 47. We had someone as old as 82 years old who was actively doing endoscopy. So I thought that was nice. <laughs> The thing we found was training in ergonomics during fellowship was rare. It was reported by 4.5% of all respondents. Um, the pressure for productivity was high. 45% uh, of people said they have been asked to increase their volume of procedure volume in the past two years. So, uh, and this was more commonly reported by women. Injuries. Uh, since starting endoscopy was associated with prior injury. So if someone's had prior injury, they had more risk. Procedure volume again was a risk factor. And screen height we found was a uh, risk factor. So, and people who ha are work in rooms where the screen height is not adjustable, they associate a higher rate of injury, neck strain, back pain, etc. There are certain preventive measures which are not commonly in place and I will talk about them um, such as micro breaks. What a micro break is defined as taking one or two minutes break every 45 minutes to 60 minutes. So after say a procedure you take a break and you are not doing the procedure you were doing or the hand maneuver, neck maneuver, back maneuver that you were doing. You take a micro break and perhaps incorporate some stretching exercises in it. Uh, so this is not commonly used and uh, only 13% of people had used it or knew about it. We, uh, as I said, found an association between neck injury and those who could not adjust monitor heights. So overall rate of injury after practice was about 85%, which is really kind of discouraging. And we found certain patterns that upper body injury was more commonly reported in women, particularly wrist, shoulder, and upper back. And I won't go into details of this, but we've talked about it. So I want to spend a few minutes in just practicalities, like what can we do? So we have established that there is injury, it can happen after time, so there, what can we do? So I like this term called ergonomic timeout and I want to talk about this in three, like what do you do before procedure, during procedure and after procedure to minimize your risk of injury. So I like the idea of er ergonomic timeout. So just like you do a timeout to assess that you have the right patient, you have the right uh, physician, you have uh, doing the right procedure, 
you can spend a minute doing an ergonomic timeout in which you are saying is the, the equipment positioned the way I want it to be positioned before I start a procedure. So what do we mean about that? So first of all, there are certain things that are protective such as gowns, gloves, face shields. Um, but what I would say an ergonomic timeout is use a gel mat. So use a mat and these are anti-stress mats and I have done a lot of procedures without them and I now do procedures with them and I will tell you there is a difference at the end of the day. This is sort of a cushioning effect. So you can use a simple gel mat and stand on it. Now how you stand is important. So OSHA and ergonomic engineers tell you that you should work in a neutral position. So you should stand in a neutral position. So the monitor, like we have two rooms today, we saw one had a very nicely adjusted monitor right in front and the other one is at an angle. So perhaps that's something to learn from. So you want to keep your neck in a neutral position. So if you, if the monitor is here, you should, it should be right in front of you. The monitor should not be at an angle mm -hmm. because at the end of eight hours or 10 procedures, there is risk of neck strain. Mm -hmm. So maintain a good erect posture and keep your neck in neutral forward facing position. Wear comfortable shoes, very important, especially for women. Some of the women who come are, you know, wearing shoes that will give you neck stain. So I wear, you know, which is so with like cushion padding because it will support your spine. So keep your weight evenly balanced. Don't stand on one leg sort of legs slightly apart stance and the monitor of the position, the position of the monitor should be at high level and really slightly below eye level. So right in front and slightly below, so your neck is slightly flexed, slightly flexed down or straight, but certainly not extended. The extension position is associated with injury and strain. The distance of the screen from the endoscopy is there's a big variation. I'm not entirely sure where that comes from. This is from the technical review. Maybe it's the size of the screen, or the room, or the height, but there's a range that has been given. Again, like today when we did procedures, we saw, so you want to keep your upper arms in neutral position, which is like 90 degree angle. You would be not like the bed to be so low that you're, you're at 130, 150. So if I could just stand and say, so you want your arms to be like this or like this. So 90 to 100. So if the bed is too far down, you're, you're scooping like this. So this is not ideal. So this is ideal. So bring the stretcher up so you can stand like this position. And the monitor in front of you and with the eye level slightly below eye level. So that is a good starting position to start. Now, if, what do you do during the procedure? So during the procedure, as much as possible, you try to maintain a neutral position uh, of your spine and your upper extremities. And of course, we know that's not going to be 100% of the time. The neck rotation should be minimized. Like we discussed, the monitor height should be just below eye level. And you know, I now consciously adjust this before every procedure. And I teach my fellows to do that. And it's just a good reflex habit to get into. You adjust the bed. When you hold this endoscope, use a towel or a thick uh, four by four to have a wider grip rather than a pinch, pinching focus grip. So pinch more force, but if you can widen your grip, there's less tension on your uh, digits. Um, a two-piece air burn for people who do ERCP is very important because you know if you wear a one-piece, you have heavy lead on your shoulders. Whereas if you wear two-piece, you distribute the weight to your waist and have less on your shoulders, less strain pressing down. So I think really two-piece shields should be encouraged. What do you do between procedures or after endoscopy? So take micro breaks. Take a one, two minute break every 45 minutes, every 60 minutes. This will release, uh, you know, lactic buildup, muscle strain, 
And during this time, you can do stretching exercises. And some of the ones that are you can incorporate in your procedure is like when you take the gloves off, instead of just taking them off, you know, you can take the gloves off and stretch, stretch the glove. So you're just stretching your uh, hand and your wrist and your upper arm. So you pull off your gloves instead of just throwing them. You pull them off and create tension and just do this two, three times like that. Some people, when they take their gown off, they roll the gown off, this paper gown, and then just hold it over their head and kind of stretch it off like that. So you just an arm exercise, just taking a few seconds, just make it part of your practice. Uh, I do know some people who lean against the wall and just, just stretch against it. So what you can do um, now, this is, uh, I think, a slippery slope. What is the optimal volume of work? Um, you know, it's hard to give a guideline. We don't have great data. Uh, of course, people may um, use that for, you know, you know, well, I can't do more than that, or am I at injury? So all kinds of liability issues, and this needs to be defined. There are a lot of questions that come here. Like, can you do half a day with a procedure mix help? Can you do three colonoscopies and then an endoscopy? Would that be easier for you in terms of muscle injury? Should you limit length of procedure? So a lot of variables unknown. And um, I just wanted to just put a slide to say that as endoscopists, we also use a lot of desk and computer to generate reports. So take the time to sit properly. Um, have chin parallel to the floor, sit arm length from the monitor, plant your feet, keep your wrists flat, and you, you, you know, in my own practice in certain rooms, the face is so cramped and you're, you know, you know, clenched in, and these are things that should be better, or the chair is not ideal, so even in the desk and computer modules, look at that. So. Future area of studies where we don't know is what is the role of sedation. Do you do deep sedation and is that causes less injury? There's exactly one study which is um, uh, an abstract at DDW which seems to suggest sedation does not matter what kind, but we need more information. Does gender matter? Do certain gender, you know, mm -hmm. doing more in women, is that higher risk of injury? What is the optimal workload? What's the tipping point? What's the balance there? And what's the optimal interval needed? I think a very key part is training. I really encourage that this should be incorporated in fellowship programs and they should be taught basics about just awareness and what they can do. This is also not difficult. It doesn't require necessarily, you know, elaborate equipment, just training. Now a word about endoscopy design. So you know the basic endoscopy technique developments have been in um, uh, high definition, in you know advanced imaging, um, resolution. But the basic design has not tremendously changed in in decades. And I think there's a role to discuss that. And uh, for example, you know if you look at the control dials, whether you're four feet nine inches or six foot seven inches, you have the same dial. So for some people, the grip is difficult and over time. So that is an example of something that should change. Um, uh, scopes that are more self-propelled, uh, less resistance, passing of uh, biopsy uh, forcep channels that cause less force. Uh, uh, minimize wrist extension, thumb force. These are things that actually we've been in discussions with uh, a lot of device devices uh, and they look at this. So the AGI a year ago started a task force on ergonomics and I'm the chair of that. And we have had input from Occupational Safety Health Association, content experts, environmental engineers, a lot of device companies. And if you have any suggestions or thoughts, this is my email, please be doing me. But very briefly, just to recap, the time to chronic injury is about 11 years after endoscopy. So think of this as your long-term health. Predictors are if there's prior injury, there's a lot of procedure volume, and there's incorrect height of the endoscope. Lack of education about ergonomics is, 
it's a, you know, a factor that should be addressed. These are some of the recommendations that we are making in the process of developing. So very simple, promote awareness of what is the risk and prevalence, improve design, develop criteria for ergonomically correct endoscopy suite, which means what is the protective gear you use, what is, where should the equipment be placed, height of monitors, height of beds, and um, pr promote partnership with relevant organizations advocacy with the industry and I think this should be important in the curriculum of trainees uh, how they adjust the monitor maintain neutral position avoid prolonged strain of wrist hand and thumb use micro breaks use anti fatigue mats um, and I, I said one piece that apron really should say two piece that apron mm. and uh, you know, we want to create uh, partnerships with people who develop endoscopes. So, and uh, at the other end, they are very receptive in incorporating ergonomic design, improving lightness of the endoscope, improving weight of it, including use of force. So, a lot of technical development is also in this class. So, I will stop there and answer any Thank questions you may have. Thank you.